wondering if we could start with you, Kathy, your thoughts on Ethereum and what's going on in the uh, decentralized finance landscape and how that adds to the sound money value proposition that Bitcoin brings. Yeah, um, I I think um, we've we've um, we've been evolving our point of view on Ether. When we when we started our analysis, we were pretty much, uh, and this was with Chris, uh, Bitcoin was uh, uh, what we needed to understand first. Uh, but we were keeping our eye on all of the other assets, and and we uh, stuck pretty closely to the thesis, the FAP protocol thesis that uh, Chris's partner, Joel Monegro, came up with at uh, Union Square Ventures, uh, which says that um, the value accrual will take place more at the currency level. And we believe there would be only a few currencies uh, in the world, much like uh, there are today. We thought we thought Bitcoin would be the reserve currency and we were looking for the other currencies. And, and Ether was showing uh, uh, was showing up as uh, a very strong second. Um, and and I have been surprised at how uh, how how Ether uh, and the Ethereum network is mushrooming uh, with stable coins, NFTs, uh, uh, decentralized finance. It's clearly satisfying a huge unmet need. Uh, one of those needs is uh, yield out there, um, and and we see that in the fixed income markets. Uh, the the ridiculous uh, uh, rallies that have taken place, taking junk bond yields down to you know just a couple of hundred basis points above treasuries. That's kind of nuts. Uh, uh, so this 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 hunger for yield is being satisfied by a much more efficient uh, financial ecosystem, and I think many more people are op more open minded to it uh, as well. Um, uh, let's see. One of the things that has struck me from the beginning, and when Chris uh, started uh, at Arc, uh, which was very close to the beginning of the firm, um, I remember saying very early on, "Follow the developers. Follow the developers." Well, uh, using uh, that metric, Ethereum is off the charts. You know, uh, uh, whereas Bitcoin is steady as she goes, still increasing, uh, steady as she goes, but clearly uh, Ethereum. Uh, decentralized finance, NFTs have hit a, a responsive chord. I think bringing the creator community into this ecosystem uh, is, you know, helping it go a little bit viral more quickly than we would have expected. So you I guys would, are you guys are bullish then on uh, Bitcoin, <laughs> bullish ETH. Yes, indeed. I would add to when Arc was beginning its investigations into crypto, Ethereum didn't exist. Right. Um, if you go back to 2014, it was just an idea. Um, when ARK first established its Bitcoin positions, Ethereum, the network, had just launched a few months prior. Um, I remember, you know, knockdown, drag out fights, arguments uh, in ARK brainstorms. I mean, that's that's putting it, it too harshly, but contentious <laughs> debates um, around the DAO in 2016. Um, and, uh, you know, Arc is full of varied viewpoints, and I think that's part of its strength, right? Allowing everyone to to express their viewpoints. Um, but when the DAO happened in 2016, that was, uh, at least for me, the catalyst of, oh my God, this thing just raised over $200 million from people all over the world. The narrative for Bitcoin is pretty much set in stone, and it's kind of one very easy to make the case for Bitcoin as an investment, but then by extension, kind of value the different opportunities. I think with Ethereum, it is a little bit different in that investors have really yet to converge on, on a primary narrative on how to value ETH. Um, and I think that that also has to do with the fact that the narrative um, is evolving in the same way that Bitcoin's narrative has evolved. Um, you know, one of my biggest breakthroughs in, in thinking about, you know, how to how to how to value ETH, especially compared to Bitcoin, and something that Kathy alluded to is that. You know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are differentiated enough where they can coexist. And in a lot of ways, it isn't really a, a zero sum game. It, it, it's, it's a positive sum game where, um, you know, the, the, you're, you're unlocking kind of new, new uh, pockets of value that otherwise were non-existent. 
Um, you know, with Ethereum specifically, I think you know there there's a question of of Ether as like this natural resource, this digital commodity. Um, and if you think about as the as the general economy transitions from the physical to the digital world, um, that you know Ethereum can command a sizable premium relative to physical commodities um, that 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 otherwise Bitcoin Bitcoin could not. And so when you kind of think about oil or coal or, or kind of general commodities, those are in the hundreds of trillions of dollars um, in, 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 in market cap or in value. Um, I think increasingly we're starting to see ETH as this productive financial asset and something that you guys kind of introduced as the sort of that internet bond. Um, and that, that is sort of broken away from Bitcoin specifically kind of with the, with the general consensus algorithm of, of, of Bitcoin versus ETH, especially as ETH transitions to proof of stake. Um, but when we kind of think about valuing ETH as a, as a, as a productive asset, that's where I think it's, it's deviating a little bit from Bitcoin as sort of that non-productive monetary asset. Um, and so when we kind of think about the potential value accrual there, um, you can kind of think of it as as the same way that you might might value a, a traditional bond. Uh, and so you can kind of kind of guarantee this this sort of yield, um, this this kind of risk free rate, perhaps um, that 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 ETH can generate. Um, and I think that because it's native to the Internet, that's what makes it so unique. Right. Um, and then that that's sort of that that last narrative of perhaps, you know, Ethereum is, is a new country or a new nation state, that sort of digital country. Um, and so that's one that kind of transcends borders um, and one that is native to the Internet. Uh, and so the way that I kind of like to look at Ethereum, what excites me most about Ethereum is is in the context of kind of this ever more more globalized world, right, where we're all increasingly connected to each other. Uh, and so there's going to necessarily be demand for cooperation on an equally global scale and, and one that doesn't rely on traditional means of identity or legal assurances. Uh, and so when you think about Ethereum as, as an experimentation layer on which you can build the, these economic primitives with little counterparty risk, uh, that's that's something that's very exciting. And, and I, I will admit that that's, that's not something two years ago that I would have been completely sold on. The cost of capital in the traditional world is really dependent on, you know, the, the, the bond market. How much, how risky are you going to get based off of the yields you can get in dollars on the bond market? But now that we've unlocked this new internet native risk-free rate with Ether staking, do you think that's going to, how do you think that's going to impact uh, global yields and, and global like investment appetite as uh, Ethereum uh, gets more and more adopted, if it does get more and more adopted over time? Well, um, I... I think part of the heightened regulatory talk here in the United States and, and elsewhere, but it's really taken off uh, in the last few months here, is because uh, what you are talking about, the yield, has attracted so much interest that the banks themselves are beginning to feel it. Uh, I have been shocked. I listened to especially JP Morgan's call. It's a good kind of staple to understand what's going on in the banking industry. And, you know, in a V-shaped recovery, uh, Jamie Dimon was telling us that their loan growth would be negative through the end of this year. I said, what? Uh, and I began to think, could it be? Could what's going on uh, in uh, in the uh, Ethereum world, already be impacting banks. You know, prices are determined at the margin, and so this could be really hurting the banks. And I think we're. I'm going to take a very close look uh, during the next uh, few earnings seasons to to see if we can dimension it. It does. You know, it doesn't seem like it is big enough yet. Uh, but I'm beginning to wonder, you know, the search for yield, uh, which again, uh, the, the extremes, the bond market in the, the traditional world, I believe is in a bubble, certainly on the corporate credit side, which is where the risk is. Uh, and I, I can't help but believe that others believe the same and are searching elsewhere for yield, uh, especially the hedge funds. 
I would say. Uh, so uh, I, I, that's the first thing that comes to mind when you ask your question. And I'm beginning, and, I, and now you're going to have to rephrase your question if you want me to go any further. <laughs> well, I just want to ask, I just want to follow up on that because the podcast and the movement we, we have here is called Bankless, right? So we, we've seen this for a while, but um, we're actually not sure that the banks are actually worried about it right now. Oh, I think <laughs> you they, think they are? are. Oh, definitely. I think part of the uh, regulatory heat that is taking place now is uh, is because the banks are beginning to see how much this is going to hollow them out 